got, you can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the same And right now, I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of, um, the founder of P90X, Tony Horton. You know, Paul, what I like to talk about is the challenging times. So yeah, like he made hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on P90X DVDs, right? But what people don't know is the way he made food and rent money is he would put his hat on the street, he was a street performer, and he would do mime, street miming for food and rent money. And... Um, I, Julie Clark, uh, founder of Baby Einstein, she grew her company at $20 million with five employees, sold to Disney. But the most impressive part to me was that she beat cancer twice. And I had Atari founder, Nolan Bushnell on, who was Steve Jobs' mentor. And he talked about how when Steve, Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. And he also talked about when he, I don't know if he lost everything, but pretty much lost everything. They decided to go a trip around the world. And, and he told his kids, yeah, we're just going to go on a trip around the world. And he had so much, so many friends all over the world, they just would stay with friends. So yeah. his, his family thought they were taking this amazing vacation. They didn't know that they were doing it because they uh, lost a lot of their, their money in their house. So there's some crazy <laughs> stories there. Um, so check out inspiredinsider.com. And this episode and uh, the show is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do is we help B2B businesses connect to their dream 100 clients and referral partners. And we help you get ROI by running your podcast. And you know, for me, Paul, and I, we'll talk about Paul's podcast that I'm going to give a shout out for, Fail Disclosure. But for me, um, podcasting is a lot more personal. Yes, it, I think it's the best thing ever for relationship building and um, to give to other businesses, to profile them. Um, but it's personal to me because it was inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany and they were the only members of their family to survive. So his words and legacy live on because the Holocaust Foundation actually did an interview with him. And you can watch that interview. I have it on my about page. I watch it multiple times a year. There's a full, like if you go to the inspiredinsider.com about page, you go to the bottom. Um, it's a full interview of him talking about essentially the atrocities that happened to him. Um, but it's an inspiration to me every day if I find myself complaining um, or thinking something's hard, I think, well, they didn't burn my building down and try and uh, exterminate me and I wasn't hiding in the forest for three weeks, you know? So it puts things in a little bit perspective there. So, but I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done uh, for my business and my life you know, outside of my wife, of course. And we've worked with Berkshire Hathaway companies to Harvard alumni group to all these, all sorts of B2B businesses. So I think any business should have a podcast hands down period. And I would tell that to someone even before we had a service, Paul, that actually did that um, because of the relationships. And so if you have questions, you know, go to rise25.com or email us support at rise25media.com. And I joke around Paul that everything good goes back to a podcast and Paul and I and John met because of podcasting. We were doing the official podcast at one of the conferences. Um, and that's how we actually met Paul. And I'm going to introduce today's guest. I'm super excited. Uh, I've admired his work and him from afar for a long time. And uh, we have Paul Jarrett, the co-founder, with his wife, Stephanie Jarrett of Bulu. And if you don't know what Bulu uh, is, check out um, their website. Um, I think you go to Bulu Box or Bulu Group, right? Bulu Box or Bulu Group.com. And PaulJarrett.com. And And PaulJarrett.com, exactly. (laughs) Um, Bulu creates private label subscription box businesses for big brands like Disney, Clorox, GNC, Discovery Channel, and many, many more. And they created a turnkey subscription box solution division to work with big brands. Um, So they went from humble beginnings. They were packing boxes in a studio apartment to occupying a 100,000 square foot warehouse. And they pioneered taking subscription boxes from concept creation. And now they ship millions of boxes to happy subscribers nationwide. They specialize in working with multi-billion dollar retail brands by offering innovative solutions 
to go direct to consumer. But don't think, oh, I'm not one of those multi-billion dollar brands. I can't work with them. That's not true. They do offer e-commerce brands turnkey services like customer service and fulfillment. So if you have a need for that, you can also contact them. And like I said, he also runs a podcast, Failed Disclosure. Um, Paul, thank you for joining me. Man, thank you so much. I'm excited for this. And if memory serves, I kind of weaseled my way into your other podcast, right? <laughs> Not uh, at all. We I'm saw you. Like, my life. Yeah, we love it. Um, you know, I wanted to start with that. You know, I talked about the P90X, there's challenges, there's interesting times. And before we hit record here, you said you grew up on the other side of the tracks. Oh, yeah. So quite, what, did, what did you mean by that? Quite literally. So, um, yeah, you know, it's a... Uh, it's one of those things where, you know, growing up and, um, you know, probably even into college and, and not until I kind of really entered the, the work world, I didn't realize, you know, where I grew up, you know, wasn't really that great of a, a location or scenario. Um, but I grew up uh, in a trailer park in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, literally the, the train tracks run, I think technically right through it or right on the edge of it. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of train hopping and graffiti and all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, we grew up in a trailer park. Um, you know, we, we didn't have shit, you know, if we just, it, but we didn't know it, right? Like my parents were married. That's probably the thing that matters the most is I always had two parents mm -hmm. that loved me unconditionally. Right. And they read to me and I always had books, right? And when you got a few of those things, you know, um, you know, you can really latch onto those in the long term. But, you know, I do, I remember, you know, going to bed hungry, you know, mm -hmm. some, given some of those times where I just, you know, acted up and got in trouble. <laughs> and I, I was like, just like, without dinner. You're going but, to bed without dinner. Yeah. But, you know, there's plenty of times when I remember like opening up the fridge and, you know, there was not a lot or, um, you know, it's like, oh, I guess we're eating frozen peas tonight and, and whatever. And um, I'm really grateful for that because, you know, even in this pandemic and what we're going through now, like, you know, it's really easy, even, you know, if the company sees some success to go back in my head and to remember what it's like to quite literally be hungry. Right. And, um, it's, it's a unrealistic, unnecessary, but also true fear that I think about my one-year-old, my three-year-old, and I'm like, I just never want them to feel deprived of anything. You know, even, even just, you know, I was the kid that, you know, now I have way too many uh, Jordan shoes, right? Because I could never afford them. Right. Or I, I got jumped one time for my shoes. Really? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's, uh, it, it's funny because, a lot of people think Lincoln, Nebraska, you know, how bad can that be? Well, when you're in a trailer park that's kind of, you know, really secluded from the rest of the world, and we did have a function in our city called Catholic Social Services where a lot of the churches would get together and they would bring in refugees from other countries. And so, you know, growing up in my school and in my trailer park, I was a minority to a lot of um, Asian, specifically like Vietnamese. Um, and those are like my best friends growing up. Right. And then there would be another like atrocity and it would be like a bunch of refugees from, you know, I hate to say, don't really quite know Iran or Iraq or wherever. Right. And when you get these people from like the Middle East, yeah. When you get these people just culturally that are different. I mean, I remember, you know, going to my buddy's trailer and his dad was clubbing their rabbit to death for dinner. And I'm like, what's happening? Yeah. Um, it was a really interesting scenario growing up and, um, uh, there was, it was rough. I mean, you know, it was very normal to be like, I remember riding my bike one day and this kid pushed me off my bike and said, I'm going to beat you up and take my, your bike because you're the tallest kid in the trailer park. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, I fought and I kept my bike, but you know, that was just normal. It was just like rough. But the funny thing is, is at the time, um, when it came to all of that stuff and all those scenarios, I never thought it was really that bad, but now, you know, really that was being just like, normal to you. Totally normal. And I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with the term like class jumping or class hopping, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, if you're poor, then you go to middle class and you go to upper class or whatever. I think that's a little bit of the story of my life. Um, Cause when I was 15, my parents did have a lot of property come into um, um, play. They had been buying trailers and whatnot. Um, my dad got a bunch of promotions and we were able to literally go from the trailer park to 
when I was 15 year old, years old, a house with a 10 foot pool in ground, a sauna, three different levels. And that was, and I went to a really expensive Catholic school and you want to talk about a culture shock, right? And um, then entering the work world and then starting our company, you know, being really small and local and then working with these venture capitalists from all over the U S and then working with Disney. Um, I always find myself as kind of like the, I realize like I'm like the novelty in the room almost. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a rough go, but I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, PBS actually did a little documentary on it. And I think that was the first time that I really realized like, Oh, cause they video, they recorded the trailer park. We had a long, what was the documentary? Was it about you or just about Lincoln? So the, the documentary was called startup. Um, it's still running. It's on PBS. Um, and it was about our business. Um, but really a significant portion of it was like where I grew up and, you know, mm. playing division one college football, moving to New York city and kind of how a lot of those experiences, you know, I had the same opportunity as a lot of the other kids in the trailer park. Right. But a lot of them are, you know, dead in jail or, you know, who knows where they are. Um, there's only maybe one other guy that I can think of that has kind of a stable life. Right. Um, but the documentary kind of focused on like, you know, how the experience have changed and, you know, it was like it, to not sound cliche, but sound cliche is like a rags to riches story. Yeah. Um, which I never would have, I still don't think that way of myself, but the, you know, can, when they kind of laid it out for me, I was like, Oh, I guess that is kind of a little bit of the story. Right. Well, I mean, you live your life and it's just normal to you, you know? And so yeah. things looking out from it's all perspective. Right. Yeah. So what point Paul, do you realize like you're just living? Oh, great. So like, I have to go to bed hungry. That's normal. You know, at what point do you realize like you said, I don't have shit. Like at what point did that really hit home to you? I, you know, it's funny because I never stopped to think about why the other kids get the shoes and the clothes and the whatever. Um, because I think one thing my parents were phenomenal at was they were like, oh, you can get those shoes. We're just only going to pay for $10 of it. Um, but we can find you work literally cleaning toilets, cleaning garages. So they mm -hmm. always really, really good about lining up yeah. the worst jobs in the world. <laughs> so they're basically to, like, you have the opportunity to get whatever you want. You just got to work for it. 100%. I mean, lemonade stands, um, you know, clean, a lot of cleaning, a lot of like people were kicked out of trailers, go clean the trailers. You know, I can decockroach a place faster than anybody. Y'all are going um, that should be a tagline in your LinkedIn. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, what that turns into then is, you know, you just learn how to hustle. And so, you know, mowing yards all day for weeks and weeks in a row, you go, well, how can I make money faster? All my friends want CDs. How can I, you know, do that? And, you know, uh, everybody. You're entrepreneurial like, back then. All yeah. Everybody always has the candy bar stories. Mine was definitely the music story where, I'd kind of uh, pull one over on the BMG and Columbia houses of the world and uh, turn around and sell those CDs for full price and um, video games, um, all that stuff. There's, you know, I always laugh at, um, you know, uh, food because I'm like, there's so much more margin in video games and uh, music, right? Well, back then there was, right? And so it was so, you know, natural to me, right? And what's interesting is my brothers and sisters grew up in the same scenario. Um, and how many brothers and sisters? I have an older brother, an older sister, and a younger sister. I would I would say that the younger sister didn't really experience what we experienced because she was way younger. Uh, she was probably we call her Oops. That's her nickname. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. An endearing but, term. <laughs> yeah, uh, but my older brother and sister um, they really dove into academics like a hundred percent. Yeah, you're mentioning your brother's a pulmonologist. Yeah, he's a highly sought after yeah. pulmonologist. He has his own practice. He has two care clinics. Um, huh. My older sister was a forensic scientist for the MBA, uh, for the FBI, and um, ended up finding a lot more money in medical sales. <laughs> mm. and, um, but she's also a nurse, so she's technically a scientist, a nurse, and a medical sales rep. And you know, my dad sat me down and pretty much said, you know, like, Hey, your, your ticket is sports, right? Like they're, they're kind of really smart, which they were. He didn't say it wasn't smart, but he's like, 
you know, you're they're a special, really, special they're talent. They're really good at these things. You're really great in athletics. Yeah. Like, that's how you're going to get to go to college. I mean, literally my dad said like, you're going to only probably be able to get in call it into college through athletics. Um, if not your mom and I, you know, we're not paying for it and you're going to take out loans or you got to go to community college or whatever. And so, um, I think, you know, that was probably the moment my is probably after a football game, my sophomore year, the next day when we were talking and, and I didn't want to watch film or do something or whatever. And he was like, Oh, just so we're clear. He's like, this is, this is your ticket. Like, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, and I did enjoy sports. I mean, uh, when you're that young, you don't even realize that most of the time what the gravity of what that means completely. So. Right. right. And, and interestingly enough, if you talk to my parents, they did not expect any of us to go to college. They were shocked when my older brother was, looking at colleges, applying for um, um, grants and and scholarships and whatever, and he got full academic ride. And they were like, we never did anything. We never pushed. You know, one day your older brother was like, just started talking about college like his natural progression. And we literally just shut our lips because, you know, we didn't want to interfere with it. And so it's funny because they never thought we would go to college. And we never thought it wasn't an option to go to college, right? right? So That's interesting. So talk about your parents, obviously big influences on you. Your yeah. dad was in law enforcement for decades. Um, yeah. my, my, they're, they're amazing, awesome people. Um, it's funny on our, uh, we were talking about my, we have a family text thread. Um, and we were talking last night about how my mom should call into my podcast and share some of the work horrors. <laughs> And this what did she do? Uh, so she started off as a nurse. Um, my father started off as a police officer. They actually then tried to start their own clothing company. Wow. Uh, it failed miserably. Um, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why, but I would probably summarize it as um, there aren't enough big and tall people to support a custom big and tall clothing store in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> um and uh, so they had to kind of lick their wounds from that. And then they did another one, uh, which I thought that was a great idea. But it So was, your parents are pretty entrepreneurial too, Paul, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my father, his father died when he was 16. Hmm. Um, and my mother grew up on a farm with like eight other brothers and sisters. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it was all birthed out of like, I don't think people wanted to be entrepreneurial. It was literally like, we have to make money to live. Yeah. Right? Um, but if you do go through my family tree, like, you know, there's a, uh, my uncle has a big dance, a big band dance. He's actually the backup to Lawrence Welk for like 30 years, which I think is hilarious. I love About big band. It's like my favorite music. Yeah, still I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Bobby Lane Orchestra. He's like 88. Still. Runs wow. Still Bobby Lane Orchestra. So band. can we find it on YouTube or where is it? I'm sure you can. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he's like kind of legend. Um, is that his then, name? What's his What's his full name? So his real name is uh, Bob Benish. Okay. B-A-S. But his uh, the orchestra that was on the Lawrence Welk show, um, all that stuff. It was called the Bobby Lane Orchestra. Okay, cool. I and E, I believe. Um, but so it's weird that that stuff was just around us growing up. I had another uncle who um, he started a band and moved to L.A. They saw a bunch of success, um, and you know, probably gypsies are a good way to explain some of the family but um yeah the entrepreneurial stuff that my parents did was definitely not like a oh let's get rich it was a we gotta survive yeah and you know we got into the trailer park because when my dad was 16 um his mom asked him to i think like help tar a roof on one of her friend's trailers or something like that and then one by one my parents you know we're talking like 18 years old people would get evicted out of their trailers and um, they would basically go to the state and buy them for a dollar. Wow. And we would either go live or go take over that trailer or whatever. And, you know, when you go into a evicted trailer, um, you know, it, it takes quite a while to get that thing fully operational again. But yeah, yeah. I, mean, I grew up and if you ask me about my childhood, like what I remember, I would say um, working outdoor in the hot sun sunrise to sunset 
And the only way out of it was either sports um, or um, probably sports, actually. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the, the thing that my dad would just constantly say to me is, if you don't like this work, make sure that you set yourself up through school or athletics to like not do it. You know, you, he's like, and he'd be like, I enjoy this stuff. I, he is a police officer and we, um, you know, started a property management company, but he was like, I enjoy this. But if you don't like the labor, you know, you got to start thinking about now how you're not going to do that. So. Um, I want to get to your football career for a second. Um, Cause that was your ticket, but um, what was the worst jobs? It sounds like you may have had some really not so. Uh, I'd say my, fun my jobs. You know, the worst one-off job was uh, um, I was tasked by my father to clean out a garage for a hoarder who had stashed three or four years of trash in a full-size garage, bag by bag. Um, And I can't even, I don't even want to get into describing to you the smell and the animals and the There's animals? There was everything you could have i mean literally three years of trash and you know a nebraska freezing winter or a hot summer um you know a lot of mice and raccoons are gonna find some oh wow there's a lot of leftover food and whatever um and uh i I would have just turned around like forget it i'm out you know that was the first time that i tried that and he said look you know i'm gonna pay a double um which was like 10 bucks an hour (laughs) Um, and he was like you can get your buddies if you want which none of my buddies went and did it except for one of them. And he goes, and I'm just going to give you the keys to the truck. You can drive to the dump. And when he said that I was 14, I should not have been driving whatsoever, but I was like, Oh hell yeah, I'm in. And so uh, for probably about two or three days straight, it was just loading up a truck with, and, and you know, the garbage bags aren't going to sustain after three years. Right. So that was, I probably smelled for two weeks after that. I got wow. Made, school and and everything else and that was easily the worst thing I ever had to do Um, but you know I also had you know I worked at the finish line I worked at restaurants I've been a bouncer I've been a security guard I mean you name it um, I've done it and I would probably say uh, the finish line was probably mentally the worst really why you mean the shoe store the shoe store yeah so um, I didn't know it at the time but I was 18 um, and I was going to Iowa state on a scholarship and I just needed, I had shoulder surgery and I just needed some sort of income because, you know, my parents just didn't pay for anything. Right. So I needed gas money. I needed cell phone money or whatever. Right. And, um, I didn't know it at the time, but I was really confused at why when I started, um, I would get strip searched pretty much like they'd, have, they'd say, can you pull your shirt up? Can you pull your pants, unbuckle your pants, pull them down to like underneath your waist pull up your socks, um, checked all my bags. And I always was given the worst jobs and they would just ensure that I was the last person there. And I, and I was like, I didn't even think to ask other people, like, how come you're not getting strip searched? And I was just treated really terribly. Um, and I didn't think anything of it until a couple of years later, I happened to come back and I was like, by that time I was playing football, I was like 315 pounds decked out in Iowa state gear walking through the Lincoln Mall and I was like, oh, I used to work there. Holy shit. That's like the assistant manager Uh, came to find out that somebody was stealing from the store and it lined up with right when I started the company. Uh Um, It wasn't me. It was the assistant manager. And while while he was basically putting shoes in a trash can, throwing them away out back, but he just kept saying it was me. And now that I look back, I'm like, that all makes sense. And you know, totally, you know, price stereotyped and, and all that other stuff. But wow. like, I honestly can't say I would, you know, when I talked to the guy about it, when I came back, like, I honestly don't blame him. Like I've, I would have thought that it was me as well. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. but he just didn't realize I wasn't that smart to pull it off. <laughs> so talk about the football. So it's your ticket, right? Um, you were recru- recruited by several schools. How did you end up going to, you start off at Iowa State? Yeah, yeah. So um, I was the, um, you know, the typical uh, um, all through grade school. I was bullied terribly. I mean, really? Like, oh, just. Um, Even though you're one of the bigger, bigger kids? Well, I was, you know, that was, I think, one of the reasons why I was a target, right? Like I was always really tall, but I was always really, really thin. 
Um, and, you know, name calling, you know, beat up, rocks thrown at me, you name it. Mm. Um, it was just that thing that happened to me, whether, um, you know, it was because I was the poor kid going to the nice school um, or uh, because I just didn't fit in with the, you know, type of students that were at that school. And um, going into high school, um, I really realized that I was going to see all of these kids that I had, you know, either been bullied by or running from or whatever. And I just, I just had a moment where I was just like, you know what, my parents would let me go to any other school. I had to go to this Catholic high school. Um, I, I, I truly made my mind up about the summer going into high school that the first person that tries or makes fun of me or brings up anything from being bullied historically, I'm just going to punch them in the face and beat the piss out of them and get expelled from school. And then I'll probably get thrown into the bad school where all my friends were actually at. Right. Um, and lo and behold, um, I was actually never really that good at football in grade school. Um, it was kind of something I was just doing just to, you know, get out of work or whatever. Um, we had football that started a week before classes started. And um, all the kids that bullied me, it was like this, it was like a class reunion of all these kids that had tortured me, right? They were all in football. Yes, yes. And I was a little bit bigger. I would say, you know, I've, I've always been pretty athletic, but um, you know, just, just always played timid. Right. And, uh, the coach. And so here I am, you know, we're all in our pads. We're all on the field. We're all how, how big are you at that point? How tall and how much do you weigh? Probably about six foot two, like 140 pounds. Yeah. So wet, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it was already starting to happen. We're like some of the groups from the kids, they're like pointing at me and I'm like, shit. I, you can't punch somebody with a helmet on, you know? And so uh, the coach then goes, okay, everybody line up. I need two volunteers. And my hand just immediately shot up. I don't know why. And then um, another kid who he was known and his family was known for being really, really great football players. His brothers and dad all went to school on scholarships and he was awesome in grade school. And they line us up. Um, probably and this about- is saying a lot, by the way, in Nebraska, because that's oh, like. Football's like in Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, my wife's nephew is the quarterback at Nebraska right now. Her wow. brother was national championship quarterback at Nebraska. Her, You're like a god her, in Nebraska, probably. Her uncle's like Tom Osborne, you know. Her dad's the winningest high school football coach. So wow. everybody in Nebraska, it's almost like probably the equivalent of, like, I say if I was on the East Coast, like, it would have been academics, and I probably try would have went to Harvard. But in the Midwest, it is football and volleyball. You know, that's that's just it, right? And so here we you are. You guys line up. Yeah. They line us up like 20 yards apart. And I swear, if you've ever seen The Water Boy, it was like. That's what I'm envisioning right now, actually. Yeah. yeah. And it was like every little thing, name, whatever people had called me, it just built up in that moment. And literally, the drill was just run and hit each other. There was no ball, no nothing. It was 20 yards, dead sprint. And, uh, Needless to say, I fucking destroyed this poor kid. I mean, I was full on whatever. Um, the loudest pop, we got up, I popped up, he was kind of dizzy rolling around on the ground, and the coach went, my God, that is, I've been doing this for 20 years, that was the hardest hit I had ever heard in my life. Wow. That, uh, and this kid pops up and he goes, do it again, coach. And he goes, no, 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 you've had enough. He's like, coach, I want to go again. And I think because his family and his history, uh, we lined up and we did it again. And I absolutely crushed him again. And the coach was like, okay, I guess we know who our best defensive player is. And that badge I took with me. And, um, you know, I, pl- I played football and I was pretty good. But then once I realized that um, literally, um, you know, force is mass times acceleration, in my simple sophomore brain, I was like, okay, I have to get really fast and really big. That makes sense. I'll be good at football. Like that's all I have to do. And um, I became notorious in my high school career for just like leveling people, putting people out of, out of games. And by my senior year, I was a six, five, two thirty, ran like a full six, had like a 32 inch vertical. And, and I will say that was all attributed to just, the anger and frustration of being bullied and 
and just saying like, I'm never going to let that happen again. And which is a really typical story, right? Like usually they become bodybuilders or fighters or whatever. And, um, you know, all of a sudden my junior year coaches started coming around, um, which was totally new. We didn't expect that at all. And I was recruited a bunch of different places and, uh, the head coach at Iowa state just kept coming to my door. All the other head coaches were maybe coming by, maybe calling. Um, he just kept showing up every week. And, um, you know, he said the difference at Iowa state and Nebraska, um, or Colorado or anywhere else is you can get on the field and play earlier. And he goes, those Who were some of the other schools you were serious about that maybe oh, would, you would have I, sat on the bench. Our trailer park was literally like right behind the Nebraska football stadium, probably about a mile. Was that a dream of yours or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I still, I mean, if I'm being honest, like I still think about like, oh, should I have went and played there, right? Um, I think people I'd say they never think what it could have should. I'm like, you're full of shit, you know? <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, I turned down all those schools and, you know, really what happened in Nebraska was about five or six of us, we got together because Nebraska was kind of rude to us. They had offered us, but, you know, mine was, um, we'll give you a full scholarship after my first semester because I had a shoulder injury, which is kind of a bullshit move. Um, and another friend, they offered him a walk-on, and clearly he should have been a full ride. And and just the way that they treated us, it was a new coaching staff, and they were just not – Maybe it more – born born era. It was pompous, the, the ego, yeah, like central. Really arrogant, super arrogant, right? Um and so we all just got together and the Nebraska football player of the year, he goes, oh, fuck it, I'm going to Iowa State. And we're like, what? And he goes, let's go, let's all just go. And I was like, yeah, dude, I'm in. <laughs> you know, and, and it was just literally the five best players in the state of Nebraska went to Iowa State. And it was a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal. We ended up beating Nebraska too, which was cool. Wow. But um, yeah, that was the ticket. And I and I got there and um, – I was, I put on 75 pounds of a lot of fat and some muscle. And my, after I set out my first year and the next year after that, I beat out a senior and I was the starting nose guard, um, which was, you know, I, I came in as a tight end in a rush end. Um, for those that don't know, those aren't, I mean, they're physical positions, but they're not crazy physical. And then all of a sudden I'm the guy looking across from the ball, you know, fighting two, 300 pound guys every snap for 80 plays and it was brutal i mean there's i don't think people really i don't think unless you live it you can really understand what's going on in the middle um of that line you know it's like uh, the unsung heroes you know what i mean because people are focused on where the ball is and that's not where the ball is that's where someone's just just has the tenacity to go after it that and just like the brutality of it you know i mean it's 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 real it's quite feels almost quite literally like a kill or be killed, you know? And if you, if you let up for a moment, you're going to injure yourself. So there isn't even the opportunity to like go light or whatever, cause you'll get hurt. Right. Mm. Um, so I did that for um, a couple of years. I started um, and I actually out of nowhere, I just gave it up, which everybody still, there's all these rumors swirling around why I did it. But truth be told, um, you know, I just, I had a neck injury, I had a knee injury, I had a shoulder injury. I mean, I, I still, I mean, I'm brutal just, in your body. Yeah. And, um, I saw a lot of the players, um, that I thought would go on <clears throat> in play. Um, they just didn't make it, you know, a physical is a big part of it. And, and I was able to kind of sit down, you know, after my first two couple of years, two, three years of playing ball. And I went, man, my neck isn't going to make it past the NFL physical. Like my shoulder, like I'm, like I'm already like, you know, too beat up to play in the NFL. I have no idea how some of those NFL players last that long. Like you look at Brett Favre and Peyton Manning and, and just, all these people, I don't even know how they lasted. It's genetics, man. I mean, yeah. it, it, I don't care what anybody says. Like it's like, I'm, I'll give you an example. Like when I would get just those little like burns on your elbows, yeah. Uh, I would take about four to six, six weeks to heal, which was considered absurd long, mm. right? Um, there's guys that would heal up in like three or four days. Mm. And, and you know, there's I would be fascinated at the research behind that, 
you know, I was eating right. I was doing, I was sleeping. I was doing all the things correct. I drank a little too much. Um, but, you know, it, it always seemed like it was these guys that were not working super hard in the weight room, you know, not eating right. And they're just freaks of nature, right? Um, and yeah, uh, huge genetic component. Yes. And then, and then when you get those guys, like, you know, that have that element, but then they actually have the work ethic, that's when you start to get the like LeBron James, right? That's when you get the Brett Favre's, right? They have the, the genetic talent, but I was definitely one of those guys that had just enough that if I spent all my waking hours in the weight room and focus on nutrition, I would be just good enough to, you know, get on the field and play. But yeah, I ended up giving it up one day. I just woke up and I was like, man, I have no idea what I'm going to do after this. I don't want to sell cars. I don't want to sell insurance. You know, all the respect in the world for people that want to do those things or do those things, but it just wasn't me. And so uh, um, out of nowhere, I quit one day. One of the coaches' office quit. said, what are you going to do? And I was like, I have no idea. I think I said something like, computers seem like a good idea. <laughs> it was like That's computer. actually not a bad thought, though. Yeah. I was like, I don't know. Like, it feels like uh, you can do a lot with a computer. And uh, that day I went home, got a credit card, bought my first MacBook. I hadn't really touched a computer. You know, I was like the jock that was like getting everybody else to do everything for him. And I opened up, I didn't even know how to power it on. And I opened it up and just started doing what I knew how to do. I started ripping and selling CDs and I started making like mix CDs for the bars and I'd be a bouncer. I'd make a mix. I'd give it to the DJ. Um, then I started making flyers, doing graphic design, um, and just, you know, any and everything. I mean, I remember the moment that somebody showed me Google, and I don't think I've stopped using it hour by hour since that time, right? And just once somebody gave me a tool that I could find my curiosities and, you know, um, that sounds weird, like, you know, get my my curiosities in business, you know, my Google searches from then even until now which is embarrassing to say but it's like how to create wealth right how to become wealthy um what am i doing or what do rich people do that i'm not doing right um and it was you Just know asking certain questions and and once once it clicked for me that the same way that i had eat x amount of calories i had eat x amount of grams of protein I had to, you know, the whole kind of like, um, yeah. you know, um, well, it's to a science, operations force, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, then you start to look at, you know, it's really a big reason why I gravitated towards e-commerce is like, it's just KPIs, which is just like, I'd like, and if anybody came to our company and saw how we run it as much as there's no athletes really working there. <laughs> uh, and if they would say that they're athletes, I would, I would laugh out of them. Like let's uh, line up 20 yards apart. No. Yeah. Right, right. Um, uh, which our company all jokes cause we were making a reference to a layup and somebody raised their hand and said, I'm sorry, I have no idea what a layup is. Um, like leave. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's where we're at. Um, yeah. Um, and you know, the way that we run our company, you know, we have a daily scorecard, um, which in football you had the, the scorecard. So, and it wasn't really that intentional. It's just kind of, the way that I knew how to do things. And it feels like e-commerce really lends itself to that kind of um, way of doing things. So, and it, it, you know, to this day, it starts out of where do I want to be in 20 years, 10 years, five years, three years, one year, this quarter. Okay. Start mapping out a plan. Um, and just like in football, you might get sick or injured or a game might get canceled. Like that same thing happens. Right. Um, you know, this pandemic thing is crazy, but immediately I thought about, I was playing football and 9-11 happened and they had no idea if we were ever going to play football again. You know what I mean? Like all the games and everything got canceled, you know? Um, we were like, do we still get our scholarships? Like, how does this work out? We're not playing football. Do we get scholarships? So, um, you know, it's A lot like, of uncertainty. Yeah, it's all, you know, it's just vision, goals, strategy, issues, discussing, solving, um, and I think that most things in life, it doesn't have to be sports, um, academics or whatever. Once you start to find the innovation of like linking those things together, I think a lot of things open up and a lot of understanding occurs. Um, but it's really time consuming and frustrating and you're going to get knocked down and 
once you realize that it is inevitable that you're going to get knocked down, it's not about that. It's about how fast you get up. I think that's when the game changes for most people. So Paul, go a little deeper on that. You said running the company and with the scorecard, can you talk about some of the um, ways you run the company with whether it's dashboards, meetings, scorecards, and, and yep. you know, how you do that. Absolutely. So we, uh, um, I'm the person that when we started the company, um, I was in every single detail. I did everything. Um, you name it, I had to oversee it. I mean, you want to talk about a micromanager, right? And, and that worked um, for about three years. Um, I definitely had some sort of a breakdown. I should probably see like a therapist or something, but um, which I do talk about in some, uh, what are those, some presentations and some other stuff that are online. Um, but I went through a phase where I realized that my internal voice was incredibly negative, hmm. you know, and it was very much like a defensive line coach yelling at you, like, come on, you wimp, like, get up. Like, Is it going. because that's what motivates you or what, why do you think? Um, it, the, the interesting thing was, you know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll guess I'll answer the, the question you had, yeah. but I'll, I'll give you the, this quick kind of tidbit story, but um, I was working one day at our company and I was typing away and kind of cursing over my breath and going, or under my breath and going like, are you fucking kidding me? Like what a morning. Da, da, da. And it was really early on a Sunday morning and my wife walks out um, and she says, uh, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I was like, look, sales are up. Like, like it's literally the best our company had ever been performing. And she was like, well, you know, it's just that I've been listening to you for the last 10 minutes, just curse under your breath and whatever. And I honestly had no idea that I was doing it. Right. Um, and she goes, do you talk? She goes, what do you say when you talk to yourself? And I was like, I don't talk to myself. There's no voices in my head. Like, are there? Like, wait, what? And I was so confused at what she was asking me. And she said, uh, she said, uh, Hey, like, let's go for a walk. You need a break. And I was like, all right, which, you know, is normal. She'll say, you need a break or you need to eat or drink water or whatever. And so we go on this walk and she goes, you know, I just heard you cursing at yourself and you know, you were cursing about this other person. And, and, and I never was like that outwardly with people it was just kind of internalized. Right. Um, and she goes like, would you ever talk to our like coworkers like that? And I was like, no, 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 no. Like definitely not. Like they're doing awesome. They're working their asses off. And then she'd go, well, would you ever talk to your little sister like that? Which she knows I'm really tight with my little sister. And I was like, oh, no. She's, no, no. She said, would you ever talk to your mom like that? And I was like, no. And she goes, would you talk to me like that? And I was like, no, I don't know. What are you trying to get at? I was like really frustrated. And she goes, well, why is it that the most important person in the world you're talking to like absolute shit? And I lost it. Like I'm talking, like I crumbled to the ground. I was like sobbing. She had never seen me cry. I couldn't remember the last time I cried. I was like, what's happening? I go, I go, am I sick right now? Like, do I have the stomach flu? And she's like, no, you're just emotional right now. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. Like, what is this? And it was just this thing where I had never, in at that time, 33 years of my life or 32, um, stopped and thought about like what the internal dialogue was. And it had always just been, that's a joke. Are you kidding me? You can do better. Keep going. That's not good enough. And I looked at her and I said, like, what do you say? And mm -hmm. she goes, well, like, and at the time we were running and she goes, well, I guess like, you know, good job. Keep it up. You're almost finished. I'm proud of you. Like whatever. And oh, here I am like on the ground, like sobbing. And I look at her and I'm like, fuck you. That's what you say? <laughs> and she goes, Paul, I think that's what most people say. And I was like, what? And I'm just like, my whole world is just like crumbling. Right. And um, she said, uh, you know, like, why don't you try to start talk to, talking to yourself a little bit better. Right. Um, and so literally go to Google, type in, what you say when you talk to yourself, because that was the closest I could get. A book pops up called What You Say When You Talk to Yourself. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but do you remember the old Saturday Night Live, Stuart Smalley, where he'd say, I'm, I'm good, good enough, enough, I'm strong enough, and gosh darn, God darn it, people like me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that skit was based off of this book. Oh, wow. Because this book basically says, in order to rewire your brain, hmm 
you have to say internally and verbally, and there's exercises, look in the mirror, record yourself, play it. And at that point I was like, you know, the entrepreneur in me of wanting to fix something, I'm like, screw it, I'm gonna do it. Um, so I went all in on that and um, it, it was life changing. And what I tell people is that it didn't fix the problem, but what it did do is when I'm kind of in a bit of a negative downward spiral, I'm able to catch it and go like, okay, is this the truth or is this just the story that you're telling yourself, right? And that really changed everything. And then my management style really started to change in that, you know, I really started to understand, you know, everybody's different, people have their skill sets. I'm here to support and foster and nurture talent. I'm not here to crack the whip and make sure things are done perfectly. And if I'm doing that, I probably hired the wrong person, mm -hmm. right? And so it was like this huge level of accountability, but also this like, this, this um, is almost like the smoke cleared of like, oh, this is what really positive, usually wealthy, productive members of society are doing. It's like this secret that somebody gave me, right? I know it all kind of sounds like hokey, but it's, the best way that I can describe it, right? Um, and then we, as we looked at our business, I really started to examine um, things that we were doing and they just didn't make sense. And then frankly, like a cool thing that happened is I became unafraid to hire people that were smarter and better than me. And I thought that I was doing it before, but then when I really was able to kind of like have that self-awareness and self-examination, um, we were able to just get people that were much better, right? And you just, you attract, when you have that mindset, you then attract those people versus the people that you were attracting before with kind of the crack the whip mindset. And in that whole process, again, you know, I'm constantly going to Google like ways to run a company, efficiencies, et cetera. Um, I kept stumbling. Actually, I was really frustrated because our business was stagnant. And, um, I kept Googling and I kept seeing this thing pop up called EOS, um, Entrepreneurial Operating System. I've had Gino Wickman on the podcast. That's awesome. Yeah. He's, he's like a god to me. Um, that's super cool. Um, and I picked up the phone and, you know, I started just calling up entrepreneurs that were happy and productive. And I literally said, what are you doing that I'm not doing? Because you, you know, um, funny story when we started the company, it was about the time Shopify was starting. And I remember talking to Toby at Shopify because if we annoyed him enough on customer service, he would just, they would give us a CEO, right? Um, and here I see Shopify like this and we're kind of stagnant. And I'm like, what are they doing that I'm not doing? So I called a bunch of people and just resoundingly, I would hear EOS out of people. Hmm. And um, one of the guys that I really trust who has a really good, successful business, he said, Paul, I know where you're at. I know you're thinking you're just going to like solve this on your own or whatever, but I really think you just need to hire an EOS coach and just do it for a year. Um, and based solely on that advice, we went all in. Um, and like when I decide to do something, like it's like all in, right? So we got a coach. We did everything. We went hardcore EOS. Um, Everybody kind of fought it a little bit, you know, they weren't quite sure, but sure enough, just over time and over years, it just became so clear that um, it was something that, you know, I think any company that's trying to scale up needs. Um, and so the answer to your question is we run the 30 EOS tools. So we have the um, vision traction organizer, we have the accountability charts. Um, we run all of our meetings kind of like an L10, um, which I'm more than happy to share with you or your people, or they could probably listen to the Gina Wickman episode. Um, and then we really step back from people and we, you know, we tell them like, you're going to sink or swim. So we basically say, you know, here is EOS. Um, and we have our own version of it that we've really just dumbed down. We still have a coach. And then we say, here's your client, you know, Hasbro, Disney or whoever. Um, you've been working here for a year or so in customer service or wherever. Um, this is the opportunity you wanted. Here's how we operate as a company. Here's what the partner needs. And it's like sink or swim time. And, you know, more times than that, it's like really ugly and it doesn't work out quite correctly in the beginning. But, you know, 
it ends up working out really well. And, and frankly, that's the only way I think that you can run a business like ours. Like I just can't be on the phone with Disney. I can't be on the phone with as big as those companies are. Um, I just, you know, don't have the time or capacity or frankly, like the in-depth knowledge that you need to have on each one of those brands. And so that's worked incredibly well, but just like anything, it was a real process we had to commit to. And I think after four years of running it, um, we're now just starting to pick and choose like, okay, let's use this tool. Let's not use that tool. But that was only after everybody kind of learned it inside and out. So yeah. Paul, thanks I for sharing that. That's that. <laughs> yeah, that's really, uh, really helpful actually. Um, and I, I want to talk about some of the milestones um, and um, some of the, uh, pieces of, of Bulu. And, um, but I wanted to first, you know, what I find companies who are successful, they have amazing people and then they have kind of a premise and core values that they live by. And there was, uh, you worked for BBDO and I feel like one or some of the core values came out of that experience. And maybe you want to touch on yeah. that for a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I worked at uh, I worked in New York City at an ad agency called uh, BBDO. Um, it's um, considered the world's largest, most awarded ad agency. Um, so here I am as a you know what twenty six year old kid, um, way out of my league. I had my own office, I had my own secretary, I had my name in gold on the door. Um, I don't know how I weaselled my way into that opportunity. Um, but um, I was doing incredibly well. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but I was actually working a lot with the CEO, which is the dumbest, probably the dumbest thing that I've ever done. But I was working and, and I was just known as the guy that was always there. I could research, put together a deck and hand it over to somebody and they could go present it without having to do anything. And that's really where I started to make my mark at that company. And um, there was a guy named Ozzy and he was always around our area working with one of our account directors. And I just overheard him talking about uh, Brunswick and I kind of went to research it a little bit and we had all this access to everything um, competition. Like it was more of pulling reports and organizing it than it was, you know, hardcore research. And um, I created this deck and I was like, Hey Ozzy, yo, you know, I took a day over the weekend and I put this together for you. Um, it was all about Brunswick and he just looked at me just completely like blown away. And our account director is like, told you he's good. And I was like, I, I didn't think that was good. I just, I've always had this idea of like asking how can I help? Or if I hear something, I'm just going to like try to jump on it, jump into it, especially if I have the time and capacity. And so I worked on like three projects with this Aussie guy. And then one day I heard somebody say John and I was like, why are they calling you John? And he's like, it's my first name. And I was like, John. And I was like, John Ozzy. And he goes, no, John Osborne. And I was like, Oh, right, 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 right. I was like, I'm messing with you or whatever. And instantly I was like, Holy shit. That's the CEO. <laughs> this is the guy that like emails everybody and you know, whatever. And dude, I completely like folded. Like I, I couldn't operate the same way with him. You know, I like it completely ruined everything with it. Um, and it also didn't help that my boss at the time, um, he was truly a terrible human being. I hope nothing but the best for him now. Um, and I hope he's doing well. Um, but, um, you know, he was this dude that, uh, you know, he drank all the time. There was a bar in BBDO. Um, he popped pills. All the, I would walk into his office and he'd be like, Paul, get your ass down here. Help me find this pill. It looks like this, you know? And then I'd like whatever. And he'd open up his desk and there was just pills everywhere. And um, he would do things like he would call like late at night or interns, parents and like jokingly on a conference call, say like how attractive she was or whatever. Right. Um, totally and this inappropriate. Is 100%. But like, you got to remember, I mean, as weird as it sounds, this is like what, 2005, um, you know, like they're just like in BBDO, like Mad Men was literally based off of BBDO, like the culture there. I mean, that's what it was, you know, it was like guys hanging out with clients, um, women doing the actual work. Right. And it was almost like this, 
it was like, we work at BBDO. This is how we're supposed to be. Right. You know, like it's kind of like that attitude. Um, and I just, I wasn't into that and I never quite fit into it. And I didn't realize it at the time when I was there, I was just like, I've always had the mentality, like I said, if I could help out or, um, frankly, if I can get into new business, that's always the way to be. And so I'm just off on Island. Sorry. One second. Some sirens are, um, I was always off on an Island working my ass off or trying to get into new business. And that always helped me on ad agencies, but, uh, yeah, we had an awful boss. Um, one day when I was working, he said, follow me. And so I got up and I started, which was not uncommon. So I started following him and he goes, where the hell is your notebook and your pen? And I'm like, uh, I guess if I ever tell you to be in a meeting or follow, he's actually, if you, your ass ever leaves your seat, you need to bring a notebook and pen with you. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and this was, I mean, he would yell at me, he'd be like, you look, you look like shit, go shave, right? Um, where's your suit? I mean, every day, it was just something. Every time he walked by my door, he just would just degrade and he was just a terrible human. And uh, so I'm following this guy and he goes to the bathroom and I wait at the door and he opens the bathroom door and he goes, what are you doing? I was like, what do you mean, what am I doing? And he goes, get in here. And I was like, you want me to follow you into the bath? And, and I can kind of find the humor in everything, right? Because I'm not even mad. I'm just kind of like, visually watching this happen in my head and just laughing my ass off at the ridiculous nature of it. Right. Um, I go into the bathroom. He's not going number one. He's going number two. And that's when I actually thought it was a joke. I was totally waiting for the other BBD guys to like, you know, hit me with like toilet paper or water or like whatever it was. Nope. He took a shit and made me dictate all of his notes and everything right outside of the stall somebody would walk in and I was just like, yeah. And finally I was like, yeah, man, like I'm good. Are you good? He's like, yeah, I'll be out in a second. I was like, and I remember walking out of there and I was like, I got to get out of here. Like I'm working 80 hours a week. I'm following the boss to the shitter, writing his notes down. Um, I always think to myself, the movie devil wears Prada had nothing on my boss. So well, Brad grows. If you're listening, cheers. Um, Last time I heard he was a sales rep for some coconut water. So um, karma. But I do, I will say this. I hope that he's doing well. I hope all that stuff has been sorted out. Um, and I think he knows he made people's lives miserable for a while. But I'll also say like in his defense, like, you know, that was the culture. You know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, and, and coming out of that, and my wife worked at an ad agency too. And she saw a lot of just shitty creative directors and whatever. And we realized that we had worked with a lot of people outside of New York, inside of New York or whatever. And the best people that we had worked with weren't actually assholes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being an asshole is one way to work your way to the top, but that's a lonely, you know, tall, uh, you know, um, um, hard, um, insecure way to do it. Um, you know, the typical ad agency creative director calling everybody morons is such a lame cliche. That's true. Right. Um, and we just decided if we ever started a business or when we did start our business, we would just fire the assholes and we just decided life is too short. You spend way too much time at work. We don't care yeah. if it'll make us a lot of money, whatever the mental pain and anguish and frustration that comes along with that um, is just not worth it. And which we have fired on that and we have not hired people on that. And, and as time has gone on really, you know, we've been pushed to define like what does fire the assholes means. Cause it's one of our four core values, literally on the wall, fire the assholes. Right. And really what we've come to decide that that means is that when people are out for themselves and they're not out for the team, um, that's an asshole because we do have some people that, you know, they're a little rough around the edges or they can be direct or like whatever. They make people uncomfortable because they can be confrontational or negotiate. Um, and a lot of people want to say like, oh, that's an asshole. And you're like, no, they're, they're doing that with the correct intention of, you know, getting people benefits for the team or like whatever. So yeah, that was a, definitely a, 
awful, awful experience in one of the ad agencies that I worked in in New York. And also I'm super grateful for it. Well, what's the, what are the core values, the four core values? So fearless is the first one. Uh, foundership is the second one, which is kind of a made up word between owner and founder. Mm-hmm. Um, um, first class is the third one and then fire the assholes. Um, and so that's, you know, those core values are what we want people to, if they're stuck making decisions, we tell them to be fearless, to act like you own the company, um, to make first class decisions that, you know, you're proud to tell your mom or you can defend in a, in court. Right. And then, um, you know, just whether it's a, whether it's a client, a vendor, a partner internally fire the assholes. I mean, we've, we've fired a really big client because the person we worked with was miserable and that hurt and that stung. Um, but it sets the example for the company. We didn't work with Walmart um, because they weren't fair and they were tough to work with. And we turned down the opportunity to do stuff with Walmart and what that does though, long-term with the employees. I mean, it, it really creates a culture. It really people you have their back. Right. Right. And, and that's to me how we're able to get really good talent and keep it. Like we, we do what we say that we're going to do. Um, and, um, you know, the core values help guide us. Right. Yeah. First of all, Paul, I want to thank you. This is like, I feel like I could listen to your stories. Uh, and so people should definitely check out your podcast. Feel oh, disclosure. Um, I can listen to your stories all day and there's so many good ones. And we, probably just scratched the surface. We didn't even um, get to fighting. What's that? Ultimate fighting? Well, I guess the kids call it MMA now. <laughs> that's, that's the one that I've, I've held off on forever. And finally people discovered I did uh, MMA and I'm like, all right, let me tell you about that. So um, yeah, there's a, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like if you're a, you know, I wouldn't even consider myself really an entrepreneur. I'm just kind of somebody that's searching to figure out who they are. You, you do a lot of things. So yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, there's so many things I wanted to, to go into, but I, I want to have one last question. And um, I also want to point people towards your, your different sites and your podcast. They can check out, check out fail disclosure and then Paul Jarrett.com. Um, it's J A R R E T T. And then um, they've, they can go to bulubox.com, B-U-L-U box.com. And where else, where else should we point people towards? Uh, Bulu group. Yeah. Bulu group. Okay. B-U-L-U group.com. But the last question, again, I'm, I'm sure you have amazing stories too with the, with the companies in the, the evolution of the company. But I wanted to talk about the accelerated innovation because right now when people hit crisis or they need to pivot or they need to, add an income stream or they need to think about innovating their own company. And you've done this with, um, you know, the service that you have with the e-commerce and the fulfillment and the customer service. So I want to talk about uh, a little bit about that accelerated innovation in these times. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, been an interesting couple of weeks, right? Um, So we've, we've done the subscription box thing um, where we continue to do it. Here's, I got a, which laying on my bed, one of our, I don't even think we work with this company anymore, but it's called Loop Lab. It's a science kit. Hmm. Um, by Mad Science is the company. Um, so we built that up and then we kind of handed it over to them, which was all predetermined, right? Um, actually, I think my kid is in our kitchen right now uh, doing a doing science. It. Yeah, if you hear something blow up. Um, so, you know, we've done that. We've built out those subscription box programs. Um, we've actually, so a lot of people don't know this, but we sold a company. We built a... Um, basically the linkedin.com for consumer packaged goods. And we built and sold that off. And so at the end of 2019, we were kind of going subscription box is great. We have the process down. It's a really long sales cycle. It's about 15 months from the first discussion with the big brand to yeah. launch. And, you know, no matter what we did, we could not speed that process up anymore. And so we started saying, you know, like what else can we do? And, um, to get a subscription box up and running, it takes about eight different services, fulfillment, customer service, web development, sourcing, et cetera. And so we said, well, what about all these smaller brands that are calling us if we let them secure, you know, 
our services as well. So, you know, we had a, a dentist that was writing a book and he was kind of creating materials on how to run like your small dental practice. And so we started doing, I think, fulfillment and I think some business modeling or customer service form. Um, and that went well. And then we brought in another uh, company that was doing some B2B shipping um, of clothes, like samples of clothes for buyers, right? Um, we started working with that. And then so we kind of were already had headed down the path that, you know, probably the evolution of our company is turnkey e-commerce solutions, right? Uh, well, um, we were really easing into that. I was literally calling people on the phone, testing out messages, asking, doing surveys, and then the pandemic hit. And we were just inundated with people asking for e-commerce help. Um, and it really what did feel- they want? It was, you know, we had a grocery store call us and say, you know, can you guys help us? Um, BOPIS is what it's called, buy online, pick up in store. Um, and at first we were like, yeah, it's not what we do. But then I was like talking and is a woman that it, she owns eight grocery stores and she seemed pretty distraught. And I was like, well, hold on. And I went to her website and, you know, it was like a pretty basic Shopify site. And, you know, there's actually some apps that are, you know, that do that, that you can plug into Shopify. And I was like, oh, here, I'll just write this email of what you need to do. She read it and she's like, yeah, I can't do that. And I don't want to do that. Can you guys just do that? And I was like, well, it's going to be really expensive, you know? And she's like, well, it doesn't matter because we're, you know, getting crushed with orders or whatever. Um, another person called me, um, a buddy of mine, actually two buddies of mine run soap companies and they've just been blowing up and they need help with fulfillment and customer service. Right. And so, um, you know, we've just been filling in those gaps um, I would say more times than none, what we're trying to do is to point people to either other people or freelancers or software that can do that for them. Um, but if, you know, it allows and they want to, you know, one company I know we're talking to, we might take equity in their company um, and then perform some financial and customer services for them. Um, and so I, I really a big undertaking for you. Well, Interestingly enough, like it's what we've been doing for the last eight years, right? But we've just always called it subscription boxes. But if you remove the layer of subscription boxes, it's fulfillment. You become a master of fulfillment. Yeah. Right, right. And so it's really nothing different than what we've been doing. It's just saying it and packaging it up in a different way. So for instance, you used to always have to use us for fulfillment to do any other customer service or anything. Now you don't have to use us for fulfillment. You can literally have us just like build a website for you or whatever it is. Right. Mm. Um, and I think the thing that's speaking to a lot of people is that we're like, Hey, we'll just set up the contract to do like almost like a flex labor or freelance. Like we know customer service won't last forever for a lot of these companies is just right now. Right. Um, and so I feel like what happened in the world was we were just fast forwarded 10 years in the e-commerce, right? Like whether retailers or whoever liked it or not, um, events have been a huge thing that's calling us, right? Like um, graduations, high schools, colleges, trade shows, they're all going like, hey, we had this idea to ship people a box. Can you help us out, right? Um, um, a lot of like coronavirus, you know, people are like, hey, we want to build masks. Can you ship them out? Um, we have a test kit. We have a whatever. I mean, just I had two calls today, but then there was three unplanned calls. So I've had five calls today of people needing something, which I would say historically what we would have in a week was about five inbounds, whether emails or calls or whatever. And maybe one of those was worth you know, us kind of being a subscription box, big brand or whatever. Well, I would say what we're getting now is probably 25 inbounds a week. Um, and a lot of those, because we're opening up the gates, um, it looks like we can do something for them. Um, and I think my team also, because we can see the world and because we can see how many jobs have been lost, there's a level of panic and fear. And 
although our business has not been directly impacted negatively, um, there's this, maybe, maybe it's even like deeper than that. There's like a sense of it's our responsibility to like continue yeah. to push the economy, continue to push everything. Right. Um, if we can hire people, hire people. Um, and so I think the team is, is really coming together and understands and, you know, the people that would have never before, um, project manage something it's almost like they're all stepping up this situation like made them realize like oh i have to and and everybody's really highly capable right and so i think that's the natural shift in the e-commerce uh um kind of those private label or turnkey solutions but you know give me a call in a month and we'll see how it's going um but for the most part as we get into the sales cycle with these people contacting us, I am very proud of the fact that like we're connecting them with the other people or entities or softwares that just might make more sense for them. And I, I view that as our job in sales. Our job is to get people the best solution for what they're looking for. And many times that's not us, but we always make it a point to say, Hey, um, we're not trying to sell you. We're trying to get you to your answer quicker. And if your experience was good with us, please go tell other people about us. And I think after eight years, that's all coming back in dividends because everybody's going, who should I talk to? Who should I talk to? And they're like, Hey, call Bulu because they might not do the work for you, but they're going to help get you to where you need to go. You're a and, trusted advisor. Right, right. And, and you know, when you deliver on that, our, our clients are always shocked when we go, uh, like, hey, you're paying us too much for this. Like, you shouldn't do that. Do this. And they're like, well, now we're just going to keep it with you because, you know, we don't care, right? Um, so that seemed to work well for us. But, yeah, it's a – e-commerce is an interesting place right now, podcasting as well. And, um, you know, I, I tell – I encourage people to – um, respectfully take advantage of the situation, right? And don't don't just cut thirty three percent and you know fold up your shop and operate in panic. Don't be the other way and take advantage of whatever you can. Like people will. Mark Cuban said this, and man, this struck home. Um, he said, "I believe companies will be judged in the future on how they acted and what they did in the midst of the pandemic." And I keep repeating that to myself, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the company that we were working with the masks for, um, we took the masks, we had them um, analyzed by a lab and all that stuff, and they weren't quite up to stuff. And so we passed on that, which that could have easily been, you know, a lot of money, but it's things like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, just take that extra, extra measure just to right. make sure like play the long ball man you know like just just like a portfolio your 401k or whatever like gotta play the long ball your health like whatever it is like set it up and play the long ball because you know there's there's no secret to any of this you know what i mean yeah paul this is amazing thank you everyone check out bulugroup.com check out the podcast also um where can they check out the podcast is it on bulu group or where can they is it on paul jarrett it's on faileddisclosure.com, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, cool. Spotify. I'm told that right now, if people listen to it on Apple Podcasts and give a review and a ranking, that that's where we need to focus. So, okay. um, but I should also go to iTunes and leave a subscribe and review. <laughs> so, and same for your podcast, man. Thank you. Yes. Check out Inspired yeah. Insider. We're going to have to plug it on ours. Yeah, I'm cool. new to all of it. Cool. So. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Paul. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Appreciate your time. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.